forward with the gospel of mark uh short and to the point and we're in uh chapter eight which means we're halfway through and uh lots of interesting things here uh and then we're going to jump into chapter nine where uh the transformation of jesus at the mountain takes place and uh oh man so rich with uh prophecy where prophecy is concerned uh not only uh, by the way of Jesus, but ourselves, because we also are going to be transformed one day. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. I just, I get real excited when I come to scriptures like that. We're not in chapter nine yet. We're in chapter eight, and we're going to be talking about uh, feeding thousands of people again, and a warning, a warning that we are not to deny Jesus in as much as he has not denied us. And lots of other things. So let's open up with a word of prayer. and We're going to jump right in. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, busy lives we lead, some of us. Help us not to forget you or to make some other thing the priority. But in all things, Lord, you, we pray, you be Jesus. You be our God, that we would serve you with gladness, with effectiveness, with the power and the strength and all the charisma of your Holy Spirit, never, never uh, denying your name and never forgetting your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Mark chapter 8, well, it says here that in those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples uh, to him and said to them, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their own house, they will faint on the way for some of them have come afar. Then his disciples answered him and said, how can one satisfy these people with bread here in the wilderness? He asked them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and gave thanks, broke them, and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And they set them before the multitude. They also had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said to them also before them. So they ate. And were filled, and they took up seven large baskets of leftover fragments. Now those who had eaten were about four thousand, and he sent them away. He immediately got into the boat with his disciples and came to the region of Dalmanutha. Well, if you're thinking, hey, Mario, we went over this already. I remember when he fed. Well, what you're remembering is chapter 6 when he fed 5,000 people. This is another event, not to be confused with the other one. Uh, this is not an error in the gospel. This was another event where he fed uh, 4,000 people. Uh, that's only counting the men. We talked about that when we were in chapter 6. It was probably more like 8,000. Uh, some people say maybe even 12 when you count, of course, all the women and children uh, that were there. Uh, in chapter 6, the majority of that multitude was uh, Jewish. That was the area that he was in at that time. But here in this region, uh, this is mostly Gentiles now. And uh, Jesus is saying, hey, if we don't feed these people, they've been following for three days. Uh, they'll never make it home. They're hungry now. They'll never make it home. And you know the fact that these people followed Jesus for three days? not considering what they were going to eat, that should tell anybody that these people really, really wanted to be uh, with Jesus. And so we ask, what drew them to Jesus? Why did they lose track of time and hunger and what are really important things? I'm sure a lot of them were employed. 
Why did they continue with Jesus? Well, it was his words and his person. And, um, you know, when Jesus would speak, we talked about it before, but when Jesus would speak, people could not help but stop and listen. And they would watch him. And they would say to themselves, this man is special. This man is more than a man. And probably his smile, but certainly his words, his wisdom, and uh, the person of Christ just radiated and it warmed hearts and it gave people a, a new hope. Now, I've noticed, I've never walked physically with Jesus, but when I'm in his word and I go away by myself, I, I'm reading, I'm praying, I'm considering, I'm comparing scripture with scripture. I'm doing all these things and the word of God just jumps out at me in an incredible way until I too lose track of time. And if I happen to have my phone off or I have it in vibrate, oh man, I'm getting 10, 15 calls from people. They're all emergencies, <laughs> but I'm caught up in the word. And you know, the more familiar we become with the word of God, the more all of that seems to happen when we're in the word. And uh, like these people, we just, we, we, we don't want to break away. At least I don't. And so, you know, we get into the Word, and what happens is the Word gets into us. The Holy Spirit takes over, and then we begin to understand and embrace what Jesus is telling us personally, the things He's telling us about ourselves, about our past, about our present, about our future, about the things that we're thinking about. And we realize, man, he's been walking with me. I've been with him. He's been with me. He, he pays attention to me. He loves me. I'm the apple of his eye. All of these things we realize. And um, it's an amazing place to be. And it happens when we're in the Word. Because uh, I repeat this all the time, and I'll, I'll repeat it again. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, it tells us that Jesus is the embodiment of the Word of God. And so that's what's happening with these people here in verses 1 through, through 10. And remember, these are Gentiles. They're not Jews. So these are people, they're not even really familiar with Scripture. They're pagans. Uh, they're not religious people, unless they were religious about, you know, whatever pagan God they were worshiping. But they're so drawn to Jesus that for three days, it just, they're not even thinking about what they're going to, uh, to eat. And nowhere does it say, does it mention at all, that they were complaining. And yet, he knows that they're hungry because he has compassion on them. You know, you know when you have compassion on someone, when you recognize their need before they mention it. That is a sure sign that you are feeling compassion for a person. Well, after the Gentiles are fed spiritually, I like this, then Jesus feeds them physically. How many churches, how many ministries do you know that do that? No, no, everybody I know feeds first the stomach, then the spirit. And that's unfortunate because most of the people are gone by that time. They just came for a meal, not to hear you. But uh, not Jesus. Jesus feeds them spiritually, and then uh, the food for the stomach comes uh, afterwards. Well, <clears throat> um, the, these Gentiles, in this area, they're, they're mostly Gentile people. I can give you a lot of uh, reasons as to why we know that through Scripture. We're not going to go that way now. But just understand that the multitude here, they're Gentiles. And Jesus' words, his compassion, his teachings, this is all new and, and exciting stuff. And many of them came to a, you know, a brand new, powerful uh, faith. It's the first time they heard him or seen him. And they didn't know the Old Testament. They didn't know about Moses and Elijah and things that had happened between God and his people in the past. The disciples were different. They were Jews. They were at least familiar with with the Old Testament, if not very well versed. And they had been following Jesus for a while. They had a measure of faith, but they lacked maturity. And that's what Jesus is going to offer them. Now look at verse 9 again. Um, now those who had eaten were about 4,000, and he sent them away, immediately got into the boat with his disciples, and came to the region of Dalmanutha. 
Then the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. But he sighed deeply in his spirit. In the original language, he got upset and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly, I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. You know, the Pharisees, uh, if you've been following with us through the, the, the scriptures, you know by now, these are religious leaders. They're Jews, yes, but they're the leaders, the religious leaders. And the thing about religious people is not just the Pharisees, all religious people, they're always wanting a sign, always looking for a sign. The problem is that when they're given a sign, they always want another one. These guys, they had been watching Jesus. They just watched him feed this multitude with a few loaves of bread and a, f a few fish. They heard about him raising the, the, the dead, uh, you know, back to life and healing all kinds of people and just all kinds of stuff. And yet they still want a sign. And that made Jesus angry. I mean, if we could read this in the original Greek, Jesus was, was angry because he understands that the real problem with these people is not a lack of a sign, but their hard hearts. Paul talks about that. You could read that in Romans chapter 1, uh, verse 20. And what you find throughout the Bible, and what I find with people today, is wherever you find unbelief, you always find a hard heart. They always travel together. It's a tag team. Uh, Siamese twins, I like to call them. And uh, so you find someone with a hard heart, you're going to find some unbeliever. Find an unbeliever, you're going to find someone with a hard heart. So that was uh, the issue with the religious leaders. Now, here's a lesson for maturity in verse 13. Look at this. And he left them and getting into the boat again, departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread and they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged them saying, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Uh, just let me pause here for a minute. When he's talking about this uh, leaven of the Pharisees, he's talking about people like these religious leaders that had this spiritual uh, position of self-righteousness. Right? We're the creme uh, de la creme. We're the, 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 the best of the best. When the word of, where the word of God is concerned, hey, we live it by the letter, man. We're better than everybody else. The leaven of Herod that Jesus is speaking of, that's different. Herod was a government leader. He was a very ambitious man. He was ambitious for worldly things and political power. And uh, he, of course, was looking to satisfy the flesh uh, with those things. And so what Jesus is telling his disciples here is, hey, guys, you saw the Pharisees. You know about Herod. Listen. Don't get caught up with what these guys are doing. Follow me. Focus on the word. Make the gospel your priority. And so, you know, when it talks about leaven in, in the Bible, uh, leaven is never a good thing where God is concerned. Leaven is never the true gospel. Leaven in the Bible always represents wrong teaching or somebody even say evil uh, teaching. And if you get a chance, we'll eventually go through it, but you can get a little ahead and go to Matthew chapter 13, and you're going to read a parable about a lady preparing a meal. And in the meal, or I'm saying, in, uh, not in the meal, but in the, in the story, the meal represents the gospel. The leaven represents false teaching that is, are you ready? Hidden inside. Why does he put that parable out there? Because then and now, much more today than then, there are so many pastors, call themselves pastors, they're teachers, and, and they miss this. And because you really have to study that parable through Jewish lenses. And unfortunately, a lot of people say, ah, oh, miss me with all that. You know, skip that stuff. Why do I got to be, you know, reading the Bible through Jewish lenses? All I got to know is that Jesus died and people are saying, no, no. No, God gave us the whole Bible to understand what he's telling us. And so the Bible is a very Jewish book. Jesus is a Jewish Messiah. There's no way to really understand the Bible 
without understanding some of Jewish culture, Jewish history, the nation of Israel, geography, archaeology, and all of these things that have to do with uh, Judaism. And so if you're not doing that, then you're not really going to make sense of a whole lot of the Bible. And here's one time uh, where that's, um, you know, true. Uh, so study the Matthew chapter 13 through Jewish uh, lenses. And, um, you know, it is unfortunate, but, uh, well, there are a lot of pastors today spending a whole lot of time trying to make the gospel taste good to natural men the same way this lady snuck leaven into the dough to make it fluffy and give it flavor. And why do these pastors do that? Well, it's an attempt to draw people uh, into the church, to grow their church. Uh, at the same time, you know, what, what they find is themselves attempting to please people and to really to satisfy unsaved people uh, in the hopes that they can lead them to believe. Uh, but in reality, what happens all too many times is they lead people to believe that they're saved simply because they showed up in church. And you could read the Bible over and over again. Never will you find any true prophet of God or Jesus ever ever doing that they were all straight shooters they didn't marinate the word they didn't water it down they gave it as it was written and the left was uh, up to the lord the god, uh, god the holy spirit actually who saves people we don't save people and so jesus never mixed uh you know wrong teaching or contrasting uh literature with the truth of god's word the, the word of god stands alone stands on its own merit verse 16 and they reason among themselves, saying, it is because we have no bread. And so they think that Jesus is scolding them because they forgot to bring, you know, bread for the journey that, you know, they filled up all of those baskets of leftover bread. But that's not what Jesus is talking about at all. One more time, the disciples, uh, they missed the point. Look at verse 17. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves of the 5,000, how many baskets uh, full of fragments did you take up? And they said to him, 12. Also, when I broke up, the, uh, when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they said, seven. You know, if, if we were talking in terms of a, of, of a trial or a court hearing, you might say here that Jesus is leading the witness because he is, because he wants to get them to realize what they earlier missed, but they're still not getting it. Verse 21, so he said to them, how is it that you do not understand? You know, sooner or later, as you continue to walk with Jesus, you're going to come to realize that everything, everything, everything that Jesus does, everything that Jesus says, everything that he allows in our life is for the purpose of bringing us to faith. There are no accidents. There are no uh, coincidences. In fact, uh, a lot of the uh, rabbis, They'll say that uh, coincidence is not a kosher word <laughs> because there is no such thing when we're walking with the Lord. Um, so everything that he does, everything that he says, everything that he allows in our life is for the purpose of bringing us to faith or bringing us really to maturity in our relationship with him. People who are mature in their relationship with the Lord, they have faith. Not very much uh, shakes them at all. And so from the uh, example uh, of the uh, Gentiles there in verses 1 through 10, we can see that um, the point of, of no faith and coming to faith in Jesus is, is very clear and, and obvious. Gentiles, pagan, large population, Jesus is there. He does this miracle after they follow him. These people are converted, man. They're changed. They see Jesus and, whoa, forget Everything I ever worshipped before. Forget whatever I had as a priority before. Jesus is the one. 
And Jesus wooed these Gentiles. He courted them. They, 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 there was this love affair that was going on with them. They, they, they thronged him. They came around. They're asking him questions. They wanted to touch him. They wanted to make eye contact with him. They were in what I like to call the honeymoon stage of that first meeting when we first meet Jesus and we fall in love with him. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing. But when Jesus takes you from that place, that emotional place, to maturity, things are not as clear and obvious anymore. And that's why the disciples were confused. Look at verse uh, 16. It says that they reasoned among themselves that it is because we have no bread. No, 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 no. They should have been more mature at this point. Their focus should have been on Jesus and his words while they were serving him and distributing the bread and the fish to those people. They should have been focused on some other things because there were some great reminders of the reality of what was taking place. Um, look at verse 19. Remember, or Jesus says here, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000 in chapter 6, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they said to him, 12. Also, verse 20, when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they said, seven. When the disciples, who had come to faith by this time, the honeymoon period was over for them. When the disciples were watching, when they were serving, feeding these people, they, were, they should have watched all these things come down. Seven and twelve and feeding and multiplying. And they were supposed to remember what they had seen before and what they had learned before. That was the whole idea. There was a great lesson for them in what Jesus was doing there. Had they understood, then they would have seen Jesus in all of his fullness. Because the Bible says he's the bread of life. When the bread was, multitude, was multiplied, they should have thought back to the wilderness journey. Um, when they were in the wilderness uh, uh, for 40 years. And who fed them there? Remember the manna would come down from heaven every day? In John chapter 6, verse 33 to 35, we're told there that he, Jesus, was the manna, the bread from heaven in the wilderness. He was the bread that satisfied. In Matthew chapter 2, where was Jesus born? He was born in Bethlehem. You say, well, what significance of, is there in that, in this chapter? Well, Bethlehem means the house of bread. And so in verses 1 through 10, Jesus is not only the bread of life for the Jews, but he's also the bread of life for the Gentiles. They should have stepped back and said, oh my goodness, look and understand. Consider scripture. Understand what's going on here. Jesus is offering himself to non-Jews, to Gentiles who are pagans. Hey, he came to the world for everybody. And in, and in, uh, in Mark chapter 6, uh, when we were there, we realized that they had 12 baskets of bread left over here. In chapter 8, they have seven baskets, and Jesus is bringing that to their attention. Why? Because with Jesus, the supply always exceeds the demand. When you've been walking with him for a while and he allows you to go without and then he supplies, you say, wow, Lord, it's more than we need. Lord, it's more than we asked for. That's right. That's right. That's who he is. You also begin to understand that wherever God guides, God provides. Always. You don't have to be begging. Too many pastors and teachers are out there begging, always asking for money, uh, really announcing to the world, hey, God is broke. Isn't that what they do? Isn't that how they represent God? God is broke. And if you're not going to give, then ministry can't happen. No, no, that's not the way it is. In Psalm 37, verse 25, one of my favorite verses, King David, when he was old, he wrote this. He says, I was once young, now I'm old. And yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging for bread. That's why Jesus specifically allowed these disciples to see, hey, 12 baskets left over. And then in chapter 8 here, 7 baskets 
left over everything that Jesus does, everything that he says, everything that he allows in your life and my life is for the specific purpose of bringing us to faith and maturity in our relationship with him. Hmm? You know, when you look at numerology in the Bible, uh, man, that goes deeper than I'll ever be able to go. But there are some things that are obvious. Uh, the number 12 in the Bible is always symbolic of the kingdom of God, of heaven. In Revelation 21, verse 12, it says that heaven had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates. And the names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. And verse 14, the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the names of 12 apostles. And then you look at the number uh, seven. It's the number of God here in earth and in heaven. Uh, Genesis chapter one and two, six days God created on the seventh day he rested. Revelation chapter two and three, you find seven letters to seven churches. You can go on and on the menorah with the seven bowls. You can go on and on with this stuff. Jesus was speaking volumes of himself to his disciples when they were there serving, but they were not focused and they missed it. They missed it. Two reasons why they missed it. First, even though they were saved, even though they had a measure of faith, they still had leaven in their life. They were still consumed with the things that Jesus warned them about. And then the second thing is that their focus was not on the word of God. You know, I can never express enough how important it is that Christians are reading through their Bibles every day. Genesis to Revelation. Because I know that very, very, very few Christians are actually doing that. And that's why they miss so much. That's why they struggle so much. That's why their faith is as shallow as it is. That's why they're always in fear. That's why they don't have the hope that others seem to have. That's why they're always nervous, filled with anxiety. Because they don't know the Lord the way the Lord wants them to know Him. And so, let's, let's move forward. I don't, I don't want to beat that one up too much. Let, let's move forward. This is a long chapter. Look at verse 22. Then He, Jesus, came to Bethsaida. And they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hand on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, well, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on his eyes again, Jesus did, and made him look up. And he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Then he sent him away to his house saying, neither go into the town or tell anyone in the town. You know, this is so telling of the nature uh, of, of Jesus. Uh, because as he's healing uh, this blind man, um, really what we see here is an illustration of our own experience, our own journey, faith, and maturity, all, all of that. Because th this guy is blind physically. And we were blind spiritually. We should be able to, in a sense, to identify with this guy. And that's what Christians mean when they say or when they sing that song, once I was blind, but now I see. Uh, they're not talking about getting clean and sober, just for the record. They're talking about Jesus entering their lives. And I say that loud and clear because too many people believe because of what shallow pastors and teachers go around preaching too many people believe that because they don't drink alcohol anymore or they don't do drugs anymore that they're saved and when they die they're going to go to heaven nothing can be more contrary to what the bible teaches and so the th this when when we're talking about the fact that we're blind spiritually the fact that we get clean and sober and we can see some things, realize some things that we didn't grow, that does not mean that we're saved. That does not mean that we're going to heaven. Jesus is the only way to heaven and giving our will and our lives to him, uh, receiving him, repenting of our sin. That's it. That's the only ticket to, uh, to heaven. Um, 
But when he comes into our lives, at that point, we begin little by little. It's a process to see things eternally. We were nearsighted, but now we become farsighted. And we see some things that we've been missing. And you know what? It doesn't happen overnight. Just like this blind man, we see only partially. And you know what? Only Mark tells us this. Luke, John, Matthew, and their Gospels, they don't tell us this. But, but Mark tells us how this guy's uh, uh, vision came in by way of a process. Jesus prayed over him twice. But all that said, isn't that our condition? Today, we see more with Jesus in our life than we did before, especially if we're in Scripture. We see people. Sometimes we see right through them, don't we? If you know that experience, you're talking to somebody, they're saying one thing, but then all of a sudden, miraculously, by way of the Holy Spirit, our spiritual eyes are open and we can see right through that person, their motivation, the truth of the story. And intuitively, the Lord comes upon us and gives us a word for that person. That has happened to me so many times. And I know it's not me. I've never had that before in my life. But walking with Jesus, little by little, these things begin to develop. But my point in all of this is that the man first saw partially. And that's where we're at today. We see more than we did before. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, Paul says it. He says, now, in these days that we're living in, he says, now we see through a glass darkly, but later we're going to see face to face. And just like this blind man, as the Lord continues to touch us and heal our lives daily, uh, he's going to, in that process, remove a lot of the leaven that is in our lives in as much as it was in the lives of his disciples 2,000 years ago. Because we live in a body of flesh. We live in a world of sin. But the day's coming when we're going to see things clearly and perfectly. You say, well, what day is that? 1 John chapter 3, verse 11. When Jesus appears in the clouds, it says that we will be like him because we will see him as he is. The day is coming, folks. Don't let anybody tell you different. And when we see Jesus, we're going to know all things, even as he is known. That's what the Bible says. Verse 27. Now, when Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi, that's up to the north, their beautiful place. And on the road, he asked his disciples, saying to them, who do men say that I am? So they answered John the Baptist, but some say Elijah and others, one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. Then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. So here again, we see the most important thing is life. The most important thing is eternal life. Where do we go after this life? How do we get there? Where is the ticket? And here it is. Jesus is asking Peter a very specific question. And yes, the question is to Peter, but in reality, every single adult person will answer this question, whether they like it or not. Who do you say that Jesus is? Well, the word uh, Christ here is the Greek word uh, for the Hebrew word, which is Messiah. And so Christ, Greek, and Messiah, Hebrew, mean the same thing, anointed one. And, you know, as I mentioned in the opening, Mark's gospel is, is condensed and it's fast moving. So sometimes we have to go to the other gospels to get the full picture. And here, if you go to Mark, or I'm sorry, Matthew, chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, uh, we get a little bit more insight on this event that took place. Because there it tells us that Jesus also told Peter, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. That's what he's saying. Because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. Your flesh and blood, you didn't come up with that answer, Peter. This is an eternal issue. 
He says, my father who is in heaven, and I also say to you that you are Peter, that is Petros, you're a little stone. And on this rock, Petros, that's the big stone that's there, the large rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. What Jesus is saying literally to Peter here, after Peter answered that question correctly, he said, blessed are you, Peter, little stone, okay? You're not a big deal, Peter. You're a little stone, okay? Uh, blessed are you because upon this rock, if you ever go with us to Caesarea Philippi, you'll see that it is a big granite mountain of a stone. And he says, upon this rock, I will build my church. Upon this rock of your confession, Peter, where you're confessing truth, I will build my church. So, Peter, God is going to use you to build his church. It won't by, be by your power in as much as your answer didn't come by your power, right? <laughs> it's interesting because in John chapter 1, when uh, Nathaniel told Jesus, you must be the son of God. If you remember that, he was reading his Bible and Jesus came over and told him what he was doing before Jesus ever came on the scene. And Nathaniel his only response, the only thing he could say, in utter shock, he says, you must be the Son of God. In Luke chapter 5, when Peter said to Jesus, you must be the Son of God, he said it again in Luke chapter 5. And in John 6, after Jesus multiplied the fish and the bread to feed the 5,000, the story is also in, in John chapter 6. And Peter, after that, said to Jesus, you must be the Son of God again. Now, in Matthew chapter uh, 16, here, there's no miracle to be seen, but Peter says, you are the Christ, the anointed one. And Jesus says, blessed are you. Wow. Why, why would Jesus come, to, why would Peter come to that conclusion? And why would Jesus respond in this other way with these other words? Well, again, like it or not, Every adult person gives an answer to this question, both by word and lifestyle. And if the answer is the same as Peter's answer, they have, like Peter, an eternal blessing. Blessed are you. More so because you didn't see a miracle. I didn't see a miracle when I came to the Lord and realized and came to the conclusion that he is the Christ, the Messiah that was spoken of all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. It was just an awakening. And that awakening came by way of the Holy Spirit, not myself, not because of a 12-step program, but it was by way of the Holy Spirit. Same as Peter here. But listen, if the answer to that question for you is something else, then you will go the way of the world. Not only now in this life, but forever. That's the point here. Uh, verse 31, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man, that is Jesus, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Uh-oh. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, get behind me, Satan. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Isn't it interesting? You know, <laughs> there are things in the world that have changed, but one of the things that remains the same and will remain the same till the very end is human nature. Peter had it so right, just a few verses, ago, and now he has it. So he could not be more wrong in his words to, to Christ here. Isn't it amazing how that happens to us? You know, in verse 29, Peter's words were entirely biblical. And Jesus said, blessed are you. Now his words are his own words. They're not biblical. He's wrong and he's rebuked. There's a lesson in this for us. When we respond to a question about God or we're commenting on his will or, or purpose or prophecy, listen, 
always answer biblically because you and I will get it wrong all the time. And isn't that why Proverbs verses or chapter 3 verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Wow. The thing is, you can't respond biblically to anything if you are not reading through your Bible, Genesis to Revelation. You say, well, I do the best I can. Hey, the best you can is not good enough when lives are at stake eternally. Be biblical, always. Verse 34, when he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man also will be ashamed, wow, when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. You know, what a lot of Christians have discovered, including myself, is that the more you live for yourself, the more miserable you will become. And, it, you know, you, you can actually experiment with this if, if you like. I don't recommend it, but if you doubt it. All you really have to do is start thinking about yourself. Just take 30 minutes. Consider your future, you know, your, your, your career uh, relationship that you might be in, um, your age, uh, any goals that you have personally and how you're going to attain those goals. Um, think about how you feel at that moment. Think about how others perceive you. Think about all of those things that have to do with you, 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 and you. And in a very short time, you will begin to notice this spirit of fear that is creeping in. And uh, hope and joy as, you're, as you're, you know, you're getting into you. Hope and joy and freedom. It just begins to fly away. And you feel miserable. You feel horrible. Then go and offer your time. Call somebody. Get with somebody. Go somewhere and offer your time and your service to someone else. Put your mind on them. Care for them. And you'll see that joy and hope and freedom returns. Because it's just like Jesus said. You know, the people in 12-step programs, they figured this one out a long time ago. And that's why when newcomers come into the room, they will often say, listen, if you want me to sponsor you, if you want suggestion from me, if you want my advice, start doing something around here. Set up chairs. Tear down chairs. Make coffee. Take a commitment publicly and show up at this meeting every week. And God knows, 12-step programs, you know, for, you know, all of their pagan practices and everything that they do, they have been very successful in helping drug addicts and alcoholics get off of alcohol and drugs. And uh, this is one uh, major tool in their arsenal of, you know, and so uh, it, it's true, because just like Jesus said, uh, there, he said, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. It's in giving to others that we find ourselves. It's when we die to self that we find our life, just like he said. And we find our life and then hope comes. Purpose for our lives comes and satisfaction. And uh, we get the call of God. We, we're in our Bible all the time. We learn our gifts. And God opens the door to serve Him, which really means serving others. And man, it is the most powerful thing I've ever experienced in my whole entire life. Well, in closing, finally, verse 38, Jesus says, Whoever is ashamed of me and my words... In this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man, that is Jesus, also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and with holy angels. Wow. You know, when I read the Bible, 
Never. Old Testament, New Testament, from Genesis to all the way to Revelation, never ever do I find secret saints. <laughs> I don't find secret saints and I don't find double agents, not where they're in good standing with God. And whenever you read the Bible and you see that God calls a person to faith or to ministry, he always does it publicly. If you recall in Exodus chapter 32, Moses asked the Israelites, who is on the Lord's side? And the Levites stood with Moses publicly in front of all of the other hundreds of thousands of Israelites. The same thing happened to Joshua. There was division in the camp. And Joshua drew a line. He said, whoever's with the Lord, get over here. The rest of you stay over there. Let's see who's who. In 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21, Elijah is atop Mount Carmel. And all of the priests of Baal, 400 of them I think it was, they were there trying to call down fire from, from the sky. And of course, nothing happened because there's no such thing as Baal. Baal was a higher power invented in their mind. It was a higher power. It was their God as they understood God. That's never good enough. He said, but if Jehovah is your God, serve him. He called the people to make a public decision. And all throughout the gospel, you find the same thing. And the gospel jumps off the pages, doesn't it? Because Jesus is calling people to do the same thing these days. Heavenly Father, thank you so, so much for your love, your guidance, your protection. Be with us every day, Lord. May we never be ashamed of you. Oh, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.